session on energy efficiency. Uh, my name is uh, Einar Bunte, or Einar Bunte, depending upon where I am. Uh, and I'm with the Norwegian School of Economics. Uh, uh, and we have three speakers here, and I'm going to introduce them in a minute. But the topic is then energy e efficiency. Uh, this is high up on the energy policy agenda in many countries and quite ambitious energy efficiency objectives for energy efficiency improvements have been set up. But as you, as you all know, uh, energy efficiency is a very complex issue with many dimensions, making it uh, not so easy to define as an objective, nor to come up with realistic strategies and measures uh, for how to reach it. So in this session we will then discuss energy efficiency from three perspectives or approaches. Uh, first from a uh, university or research perspective, represented by Professor James Sweeney from Stanford University. Secondly then from an international analysis and policy perspective by Samuel Thomas from the International Energy Agency. Uh, and then from an industrial or business perspective, by Topi from the Norwegian company, aluminium company, Norsk Hydro. So these are then the, and the, each speaker will really get the option to 20 minutes uh, for the first uh, intervention, so to speak. Then we'll have a round of debate among the members of the panel, and then we'll open up for questions and comments from, from the floor uh, afterwards. Well, the first speaker is then Professor uh, Jim, uh, James Sweeney uh, from, the, from Stanford University. He is a professor of management science and engineering at Stanford University. He has had a number of positions at Stanford. He has been director of the Energy Modeling Forum uh, of the Center for Economic Policy Research. And from 2006, he has been the director of the Free Court Institute for Energy Efficiency at Stanford. He has been quite an active IA member and contributor, and in 2008 he received the outstanding contribution to the Professions Award from the IA. So now I need that floor to Jim. Thank you. Thank you. And I can you hear me without this microphone? I hate microphones. That's why I get mine out. Mine's the one that's had my name on Jump in the 
world oil price from, it was at that time $2 a barrel to $11 a barrel, which was actually quite a shock. We had in the US gasoline lines, um, allocation programs, uh, thrown into a deep recession. It was a shot across the bow. And as a result, um, there were a lot of government agencies set up in the United States to deal with energy issues uh, at the national level, the state level. Uh, we also had international agencies, such as the International Energy Agency. But at that point, the, this is fossil fuel production. You see that little purple in there? That's nuclear. Um, green is the renewables, almost all hydro in the rest of the world. And then this, this blue was the energy, energy consumption, and the gray was the growing imports. And that, the growing imports was, uh, created a, a sense of vulnerability in the United States. But if you look at the demand side, which I'm looking at, it was growing right along with the economy. There was no reason whatsoever in anybody's mind for energy efficiency. When, when industries expanded, they, the fact that proportions remained roughly constant, it would be randomly moved up or down, and energy could move up, could move down as a fact of proportion, but there was no systematic movement uh, towards energy efficiency. Um, so that, that uh, the use of energy grew with the economy. If you look at this, this is uh, energy per unit of GDP, the energy intensity, uh, and basically, if you look from 1950 through 1973, you draw that line as an average half of a percent per year reduction in, in the use of energy per unit of GDP, of course, adjusted for inflation. So at that time, the expectation was that energy demand would continue to grow at a pretty substantial rate. These were from the Project Independence Report, but quoting a group of other, other prominent studies that were out there. Um, if, if you follow that same trend, which I'm going to call the no energy efficiency trend, it's not what happened, but it's what would have happened had we not done something. And we, I do not mean the government, I mean the private sector, all of the people that were making making decisions in there, as well as the government. This is the, this is the, taking the actual growth of the economy, but subtracting this half of a percent rate trend, just as we had before, and I think of that as a no energy efficiency benchmark. Uh, here's, here's where those forecasts fell in. They were only looking to 1985. This benchmark was a little bit lower, and I've chosen the benchmark uh, in the so the, the lower growth rate uh, relative to the way I could have drawn those little lines in the, in the past. The National Petroleum Council was a little bit more aggressive in their belief about the use of energy, but most of the others were sort of in the range of what was expected, what, what would be expected in this no energy efficiency trend. So it said it was a shot across the bow, and the U.S. government decided, discussed, debated really three classes of strategies. Uh, one, accelerating supply, and these, by the way, are quotes from the Federal, from the Project Independence Report uh, done, done in 1974. Accelerated supply, what they call conservation, we would, I would now call efficiency and emergency preparedness. They said, okay, we've got to do a combination of those two, with some notion that they would be equally, at least the first two may be equally important. So there was an anticipation that there would be energy efficiency measures, policies like auto standards, investment tax credits, thermal standards, some expectation that that would lead to some energy demand reduction and, and the estimation pulling those together about seven quads or quadrillion BTUs of, of energy by 1985. So those were the expectations. So expectations were 
we would do something that would start reducing from the trend. So what actually happened? That's actually the growth of energy in the US economy, as opposed to what I just looked at. Um, it looks quite different. Uh, and you can look at it as sort of energy use per dollar of GDP. And I'd like to think of it in really three eras. The first year before we had an energy crisis, we had low energy prices. The private sector saw low energy prices. There was almost no policy measures. The energy per unit of autonomy was declining about half a percent per year. Then we had the energy crisis, a time of very intense policy and very sharply rising energy prices. And so corporations started innovating differently. They innovated in a way to move away from the use of energy because it, because it was expensive. Households started moving away from the use of energy because it was expensive. Resident industries and sector did the same thing. And the government started putting some policies in place. Then in the uh, mid to late like, 80s, the energy, oil prices dropped, energy prices dropped along with it. The policy attention went away, and the growth, the decline rate went down to 1.7 percent a year. These are pretty small numbers, so it appears. 2.7 percent, 1.7 percent, but small percentages over a long time can make a big difference. Uh, if you look at energy use per unit of GDP in the U.S., it was 14,000 BTUs per dollar, 73. It's six in 2014. Most all of this I will call energy efficiency, and I'm going to come to the definition of it in a moment because it may be different than some physicists or engineers use uh, here. Um, the important thing I also take from this is that the process of energy efficiency has never been dramatic. It's been boring. It's a little bit at a time, cumulatively making a large amount of difference. In fact, it's been quite invisible. You don't see the energy that you don't use. You go buy a house and it has a solar panel, and you say, yeah, they put a solar panel on. You usually go buy, don't go by and say, you know, it's probably well, they well insulated their homes and put LED lighting in there um, and actually turn off the television when they're not using it. You know, they train their kids better than I train mine. Uh, so it's been invisible, but cumulatively a large amount of difference. So that's the difference between what I think would have happened had we had no energy efficiency and the reality. The difference is about 80 quadrillion BTUs, 80 quads for the US alone. Big number. Uh, in fact, if you look at the recent trend, we used the same amount of energy in 2014 as we used in the year 2000, but the economy grew 28% in that time. So something was happening both in the industrial sector, commercial sector, and the way we use energy that, that has been leading to this changing of factor proportions, changing in the way firms innovate on, on energy. Um, now, I want to go to, to the definition because the physicists and engineers I work with tend to define uh, energy efficiency as reductions of energy used to accomplish exactly the same work. That's a physical definition. As an economist, I don't think that's a useful definition. I use things that I talk about economically efficient reductions in energy use. So if you telecommunicate, telecommunicate, commuting to a meeting, and you get all of the same function from it, but use a lot less energy, and you did it because it's worth, worth your while to save the cost of the trip, that's energy efficiency by my point of view, and I'm gonna use that, that concept as I'm 
Uh, it's more of an autonomous concept rather than a physicist concept. So what's happened on the supply side? Remember, we're going to have supply strategies as well. Well, it's not quite as dramatic. This black is the fossil fuel production. You know it's a pickup recently, and you've heard everybody's excited in the US about tracking for natural gas and oil and the increase in supply. You see uh, advertisements saying US is a new energy power in the world. That's that flip. Uh, that increase. That green is renewables. Nuclear went from nothing to something significant. And, and the imports, that's the gray, had moved down to what they were in 1973. I view that the dominant reason, if you look quantitatively, is we've had a big pattern of energy efficiency throughout the economy, and that's made a, that significant impact. So if you look a little at the supply side of the market, um, you see that this, this blue is natural gas, and that's crude oil. Those have increased significantly. But notice the scale here is much different. This is a 90 quad total scale. And so the difference between what we had in 1973 and what we have now in natural gas is a few quads, three or four. Uh, if you look at, at I want to look at the renewables. Uh, well, the renewables are still dominantly hydropower and wood burning and waste. That amount is, is uh, biomass. It's mostly corn-based ethanol, which I personally think is, is a terrible energy policy. That amount is uh, wind energy, that's geothermal, and that's solar. Notice the scale is two and a half quads. So what we thought, of, what we thinking about policies that are making the difference in shaping the energy economy, uh, that you might want to compare that two and a half quads that really came over the last 15 years with the 80 quads that we got over a 40 year time period in energy efficiency. So uh, where did that happen? All over. That's the industrial sector. We use about as much energy now as we did in 1973 in industrial. The last part of it is probably China competition. The first part of it was not. It was, cho it was choosing products that were less energy efficient. Uh, transportation sector, commercial sector, uh, excuse me, residential sector, commercial sector. That, that 73 was a breaking point for all of those. Um, for example, the ongoing lighting revolution, we, we generate light, light with, uh, we can use 11 watts, which was a, when we used 60 watts before. Uh, but it's not just the compact, the LEDs, it's, it's the, uh, the electronic ballast and placing magnetic ballast for more energy efficiency in, in conventional fluorescent lighting. We think about new insulation, but pool pumps uh, for those homes with pools, the variable speed make a lot of difference. Uh, refrigerators move from about 2,000 uh, 2, kilowatt hours per year down to about 500 as, as of the year uh, 2008 going downward, mainly as a result of some technological changes that allow new regulatory policies. I think that the, the federal government is probably the least responsive to economic forces, and they move the energy intensity of government buildings, federal government buildings, move from 200,000 BTUs per square foot to about 120 <laughs> over that time. We have data centers, and you look at um, sort of net apps. They expect to save about $7.3 million a year by having uh, a much more efficient data centers. Why did they do it? Well, it's government policy. It was pure profit motive in order to do that. Uh, we have uh, computer system visualizations. 
you notice this net app, you have is marketing and showing how there's a good way to return by having computer visualization, mean, meaning you need a lot less hardware to accomplish the same end. Uh, fuel economy of vehicles, this was a regulatory rule in 1973. The average car got 12.5 miles per gallon. Uh, is that for the 20 minutes or the 30 minutes? Oh, okay, good. Uh, I like to think of it as gallons per 100 miles. That's eight gallons per 100 miles. It moves on very rapidly because of the fuel economy standards imposed, and it's down to now four gallons per 100 miles, a ton and a half uh, over that time period. When that happened, the auto industry said the cars will be wimpy. They won't accelerate. You won't, you'll have accidents going onto the freeway. You might look at, well, let's jump over. You may look at what happened from 1975 to 1985. The average zero to 60 times did a change and it's been going down ever since. So they didn't get wimpy. What happened is here between 73 and 14, same interior room, but the front end is a lot different. The back end is a lot different. This is turbulent flow, that's laminar flow. The aerodynamics are different. Those are engineered into the car. Vehicle mile travel didn't change much, but look what just happened in the US recently. That, I, I don't quite understand the phenomenon, but I think it has a lot to do with the millennials. Uh, coming into and, and having very different driving patterns. Um, aircraft fuel economy gain, that, it suppressed zero, zero would be about down here. The engine fuel economy between 60 and year 2000, uh, there was about a 40% reduction. But aircraft seat mile, uh, fuel per seat mile, has gone down 70%. And everybody knows what it's like to be on a crowded airplane, so that may not be economically efficient. But it was a profit mode of driving this. This was not a regulatory intervention. Um, internationally, internationally, now I'm going to only go back to 2080. What happened in the United States? The United States was less energy efficient than the rest of the world. So it had much more opportunity to change there. The rest of the world, and this is country groups, has been declining. It's been a significant decline, but not nearly as dramatically as in the United States, except in China, where it was off the map in terms of its energy use, and now it's back on the map. Um, the other th only one moving the opposite direction is the Middle East. Uh, what led to it? Well, really, it was a bunch of things all working together. It's really difficult on the aggregate to sort out things because many of them work together. First, the high prices motivated companies to innovate entirely different ways, including in their managerial practices as well as their technology. Um, attitudes changed. It was a wake-up call. The expectations of the future changed. Regulations forced energy efficiency. R&D, some sponsored by the government, some in the private sector, created new opportunities. Government programs, not subsidies. Um, take an example, DuPont um, titanium technologies. If you can read the quote quickly, basically they said, it's boring. It's not, no eureka moment. It's just one motor, one valve at a time, and that's how, over time, they reduce the use of energy per unit of, of their output, 30%. But then they upgraded hardware and software and, and control rooms to give better energy information, invented new pigments that use less energy. Then new investment in plants will utilize different manufacturing methods. By the way, most of these will not go into your data about energy efficiency investment. It's just what the private sector is doing for profit. Um, Microsoft, 
uses this dashboard and big data in order to monitor the energy use in each one of their buildings, and they can do it at different time scales in order to find ways of saving money and energy efficiency. Many companies have internal carbon pricing policies, e either for strategic investments like ExxonMobil does, or for operational, operational incentives on, on managers, uh, which um, then change impacts. We have a slew of, of appliance efficiency standards at the federal level and at the state level. We have energy use labeling, which now allows consumers to see what the costs are, information strategies, all of those. So when I think about energy efficiency, I don't talk, think about some of the government programs because actually they've been the least of what's significant in energy. It's really a whole different way in the private sector you're operating based on economic forces leading energy efficiency. So I have my principles, and at this point I'll stop because I've been told I'm way over time. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, we could open up for some clarifying questions, but because the question said, I think we leave the questions uh, uh, to the end. So then the next piece will be then the uh, uh, Samuel uh, Thomas. Yes, and he is then uh, uh, a senior uh, program manager at the Energy Efficiency Unit at the International uh, um, Energy Agency since October 2014, where he is focusing on energy efficiency market report, the policy halfway series, the multiple benefits work stream, and the agency work on uh, energy efficiency and behavior. And before joining the agency, he was a civil servant at the UK's Department of Energy and Climate Change. He has a master degree in economics from Birch Beck College in London. So we'll talk to you. Thanks, Ida. And uh, thanks to Jim for uh, opening up. Um, I think Jim's right in many ways. We should be shouting about what's happened over the last, well, since 1973, essentially because we have made an awful lot of progress on energy efficiency. Um, however, a lot of that is invisible, as, as, as Jim said. In fact, it's not sexy at all. It's like lots of small bits of improvement happening right across many different sectors. And uh, my old Secretary of State, uh, my minister, when I was working back in the UK, used to say that real men build power stations. And uh, by that, I think he really meant that real men don't do energy efficiency, it's not kind of a sexy thing, it's not something that as a minister I can go along and you know, sort of cut a tape on and get a really good photo opportunity. Uh, so I think energy efficiency does kind of suffer a little bit from an image problem and that actually lies behind the motivation for a couple of the pieces of work that I'm going to talk about today. So uh, in the unit we've done our energy efficiency market report which aims to kind of shine a light on what's actually happening out there. Uh, and also we produced a book called Capturing the Multiple Benefits of Energy Efficiency, and it's an ongoing work stream. And this is really about trying to shine a light on the, to, to the different sectors of the economy, uh, the different, sort of like the health sector, or the sort of think about that wider macroeconomic picture, things where energy efficiency can have a positive benefit to try and join up across different government departments, because quite often government departments in our member countries can act in quite a sort of siloed way, make decisions without taking account uh, all the impacts across different sectors. So, just before I get going, um, just a brief introduction to the agency. Uh, so we have 29 member countries, uh, a lot of them are in Europe, because small countries there in Europe, but also um, we have US, Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and Korea, and the European Commission also uh, gets involved with in our work. We're headquartered in Paris. We have a governing board uh, that um, agrees our program of work, and our secretariat is headed up by, uh, well, will be headed up from um, September by a Turk, uh, Fatty Birol, who's currently our chief economist, but he's about to become our executive director. Uh, founded in 1974, as Jim said, that you know, the real trigger for the founding of the agency was the, the oil crisis uh, the, the, in the preceding year. 
Uh, but since then, the concerns of our member countries have broadened to include, include not just energy security, but also uh, economic growth and sustainability issues. And uh, energy efficiency, I think, lies at the, you know, can lie at the heart of solving all those three problems uh, and meeting those objectives. So, before I get on to talk about the books, just a little bit more about the motivation behind the work of the Energy Efficiency Unit in this space. So, the first thing to say is that energy efficiency is good for growth. So, first of all, look at some modelling that the agency produced uh, for our World Energy Outlook publication. Uh, and this looks at the difference between two scenarios. The two scenarios being our new policy scenario, which is a kind of base case taking into account recent policy announcements. This is back in 2012. Uh, and compares against an efficient world scenario where all of the economically rational investments are, uh, are undertaken. And that would increase investment between the two scenarios by 12 trillion US dollars, but would increase overall economic output by 18 trillion, cumulatively speaking. You can see that the benefits in terms of increases to GDP are spread across a number of regions, particularly for fuel importers, not beneficial for all regions of the, uh, of the globe. The, the big fuel exporters uh, would see a small decrease in GDP. But overall, uh, energy efficiency, good for growth, as it allows for a reallocation of resources uh, to more efficient sectors. So energy efficiency also good for sustainability. Uh, one of the concerns of our member countries is around uh, meeting internationally agreed greenhouse gas emissions targets. Uh, so this is another modelling exercise from our Energy Technology Perspective series. So this looks at a six degree scenario. Again, it's a kind of base case, a more pessimistic base case in this case, uh, against a two degree scenario. And we can see that there are a number of ways of meeting that target over time. And energy efficiency is responsible for roughly about 40% of the abatement action uh, from our modeling exercise over the period of 2050, and more than 40% in the short run because energy efficiency investments tend to be the most cost effective things that one can do uh, to support a sustainable emissions trajectory. Energy efficiency also good for energy security. Um, Jim talked about the issue of fuel imports, uh, and particularly in the US. So, this is um, Another slide from our 2012 World Energy Outlook uh, publication, which showed uh, forecasts for uh, fuel imports, sorry, oil imports in the US over time. And uh, you can see that those imports are projected to fall dramatically over the next uh, 20 years. Most of the kind of media attention was focused on this segment here, which is the increase in new forms of oil supply, or tight oil supply. That got most of the most of the press coverage. Whereas, actually, you can see that towards the end of the period, the CAFE standards and so the fuel efficiency uh, standards in the US are project, projected to drive much more of the proportion of those uh, uh, of that reduction in oil imports over time. So, again, energy efficiency really kind of struggling to sort of assert itself, I think, in the media. Um, so. That was kind of one of the real sort of key drivers behind the work that we do. Uh, one of those pieces of work was our energy efficiency market report, uh, which we used to try and sort of shine a light on what's actually happening out there in the market at the moment. We used a number of different methodologies to try and work out how much investment was actually taking place uh, at the moment, what well, was sort of 2012 backcasted. Um, and obviously a very difficult thing to do because as Jim said, we're talking about millions and millions of individual transactions, gross stuff, which has a big cumulative effect. So we use some top-down methods, including the LEAF model from Argonne National Labs, to calculate uh, the investment figure. We, we reckon it's between 310 and 360 billion US dollars, which compares very favorably with investment in uh, other forms of, uh, of um, energy on the supply side. In the market report, 
we also did the same sort of analysis actually that Jim was talking about from an international perspective here. We have data for all 11 of our member countries going back to 1973 and the founding of the agency. This is what total final consumption looks like across uh, across that period from 1973. As Jim said, it's been a pretty pretty flat. Um, and this is the hypothetical energy use that there would have been had there been no energy efficiency improvements. So to calculate this, we did a decomposition analysis. So we tried to take account of both um, activity, so GDP, population growth, and also structural change in the economy. And we, we were trying to sort of put uh, energy efficiency on a par with other fuels, which tend to dominate in the media, even tend to dominate in our own agency. So just like an investment in a wind farm or uh, an oil rig would generate returns over a period of time, similarly an investment in an energy efficiency project is going to generate returns over time. So it's invested in 1999, then by 2004 it's going to be generating annual returns, and then 15 years down the line it's still going to be generating, generating uh, economic returns to those people that have invested. So, If we just look at that last data point there, so in 2011, from this analysis, and break that out into, um, into a bar chart, we can see that in 2011, energy efficiency savings were contributing more to meeting energy service demand than any of those individual fuels that make up total final consumption. So that's why we call it in the agency the first fuel bit of a gimmick you might say, but it's kind of a, weird, you know, it's kind of a way of uh, really highlighting the importance of energy efficiency and the savings that have occurred over time. And we've seen that kind of language being taken up by some of our member countries and maybe the European Union now has a sort of slogan, energy efficiency first. So um, hopefully we're having some impact uh, with that. So, if going back to 1973 is a bit too much for your tastes in terms of decomposition analysis, we also looked back to 2001 for a large number of countries. We have data going back to 2001 for 18 of our member countries. And um, if we just isolate the impact of economic, and, uh, economic growth and population growth over time, we can see that uh, total final consumption would have been expected to rise by about 7 or 8% over the last 10 years. If we look at structural change, so just try and isolate the impact of changes in the structure of the economy, we can see that that did have a dampening effect on total climate consumption, but not by as much as some people might imagine. Quite often people say, oh yeah, you, know, you reduce the energy intensity of the economy because you've offshored all of your heavy industry. We find that uh, the impact of structural change over the last 10 years has been relatively flat, although over the last three or four years, obviously, there has been a downward trend. This is actually what total weight final consumption looked like over that period. Uh, so again, roughly sort of three or four percent, four or five percent lower. And if we just isolate the effect of changing efficiency, we can see that essentially it's kind of, it's, it's kind of almost exactly uh, outweighed the impact of economic and population growth. So in a sense, we can say that at least over that 10-year period, uh, economic growth and energy consumption appear to have decoupled. However, we shouldn't be uh, sort of glibly optimistic because uh, if you look at that efficient world scenario that uh, I showed you earlier and compare it with what we actually predict is going to happen, we think roughly only about a third of the available economic potential is likely to be taken up over the next 20 years, given the current policy environment. This one of my next slides was done about two or three years ago now. There have since, since then been some significant policy announcements. However, it would, you know, I think one could definitely say that roughly about half of the uh, available potential is unlikely to be taken up unless, uh, unless new, new policies are put in place. Uh, especially obviously with recent reductions in fuel prices, some of those drivers that Jim was talking about are going to be less strong in the uh, in the mix of incentives facing the private sector. So that sort of huge opportunity going unrealised was uh, another motivation behind the other piece of work I'm going to talk about, which is our work capturing the multiple 
benefits of energy efficiency. This is something that our member country governments uh, really wanted us to push, partly because they wanted to be able to, you know, from their energy ministries or their environmental ministries, to be able to go to other parts of the government and say, look, you've got to take account of these other benefits that are happening elsewhere in the economy. And secondly, because from a cost-benefit analysis perspective, uh, it appeared that uh, countries weren't just taking account uh, of impacts, for example, on health of its citizens or air pollution impacts uh, as, with, as, as, as uh, methodically as they should. So it's kind of a, both a sort of policy and, and analysis-oriented task. Uh, this is our kind of logo from the book, which is a bunch of benefits associated with uh, energy efficiency action. Not all of those apply to all energy efficiency actions. Some of them are sort of societal in nature, so reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, for example, increases in economic growth. Others are more distributional, so asset values obviously will just accrue to those that own the assets. Disposable income changes will accrue to those um, on the uh, so private sector households, for example. In the book, we didn't look at all of these uh, all of these benefits. We just focused on uh, the macroeconomic side, public budgets, health and well-being, energy delivery, and industrial productivity. Uh, I'm just going to briefly take you through uh, those five sections in the time I've got available. So on the macroeconomic side, um, I mean, just to start with the obvious, I mean, I'm talking to uh, a room full of economists. Essentially, you know, if we're talking about cost-effective microeconomic uh, uh, so interventions from a microeconomic perspective, then they're almost bound to have a positive effect at the, at the macroeconomic level. Um, and that's mainly the things on the right hand, right hand side of the equation here, so the energy demand reduction effects, as we call them in the book. I mean, essentially, we're thinking about energy efficiency here as a productivity shock. So, uh, as Jim said, you're kind of getting, you're getting, you're needing less energy for a unit of output, or maybe you're using more energy for a lot more output, uh, but essentially you're having a productivity shock. Uh, so, you need, um, uh, and in a domestic setting, that might mean that households get higher disposable income as they're able to satisfy their energy service demand with less, uh, using less fuel. And obviously on the, on the uh, business side, uh, businesses become more profitable relative to the situation in which they are not undertaking energy efficiency and that can make them more competitive uh, and will eventually feed through to essentially higher incomes to shareholders and, uh, and workers depending on the exact setup. Uh, of the economy. On the left hand side we've got the investment effects. These are more dependent upon the state of the economy in which the investment is taking place. Uh, we saw around the time of the 2008-09 uh, economic shock that there were quite a few uh, policies put in place, including some energy efficiency policies aimed at improving uh, macroeconomic outcomes. And certainly in that type of environment, then an increase in investment where there are slack capital markets and slack labour markets can lead to increases in GDP and increases in employment. Um, obviously, if you're in a more sort of equilibrium type of situation, then the effects are going to be much smaller. However, we do find that, at least with some energy efficiency investments, they can be quite labour intensive, particularly on the building sector, and also distributed geographically as well. So most economies will have some areas where there are labour markets that are more loose, uh, buildings tend to be throughout the economy, if they need to be retrofitted, then in those parts of the country where they do have sort of slack resources, uh, then it can have a positive effect on those local labour markets. So the crucial thing really, I think, is to sort of get it, to, to, to allow energy ministries to be able to go to their uh, finance ministries and say, look, we've got a policy here that is going to have a positive macroeconomic uh, impact. Um, obviously, it can be very small, it's just an individual policy. At the strategy level, then it's uh, more important to be able to do modelling exercises. And in the book, we talk about the various different models that one, one could use. Um, personally, having been in, a, in an energy ministry trying to deal with finance ministries, 
I think CGE models are the model of choice because even though they make obviously all sorts of assumptions about the economy being in equilibrium, at least they sort of provide uh, a sort of more uh, conservative estimate of the impacts of energy efficiency. And if we're talking about productivity shocks, they should still be uh, positive impacts. Balancing budget, uh, public budgets, well, I guess this is kind of like a sort of follow-on really from the macroeconomic side, particularly for uh, finance ministries who quite often have models of the economy that are designed to work out tax revenue implications of policies, uh, don't tend to be very well designed with energy efficiency in mind. Um, but if, they, if there are positive macroeconomic effects, those should feed through into impacts seen in the types of models that finance ministries have. Essentially, with energy efficiency, you're likely to see activity-related taxes go up, so uh, value-added tax or sales taxes, uh, income taxes, property taxes, if we actually see, um, see the impact of energy efficiency feeding through into property values, um, and there is some evidence that from, from hedonic pricing studies now that that is starting to happen. Um, obviously, in some sectors, you will uh, in, in the less energy efficiency sectors, you'll see some sales going down, but overall you should see uh, revenue, uh, the revenue implications being positive for exchequers. Social welfare spending should go down if there are employment effects from your energy efficiency policy. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about health in a moment, but if you have a publicly funded health service and there are health benefits, then you should see reductions in spending on the health sector too. Um, energy subsidies should go down on both the demand and the supply side but as should uh, carbon tax revenues if, uh, if those are in place. Um, and then finally on the sort of public sector side itself, uh, if there are investments to be made, obviously that's going to increase costs in the public sector, but if those investments are happening in the public sector's own stock, then there should be benefits in terms of reduced expenditure on energy. I mentioned the health sector. Uh, in this book, we look particularly at health arising from changes in uh, the building stock as opposed to uh, kind of local air pollution from transportation and uh, power stations. And we found that uh, there was some good evidence, particularly from some of our member countries. Uh, New Zealand actually had probably the best scheme here, where they showed that uh, if you really target your energy efficiency policies uh, at people who have particular health conditions, particularly respiratory health conditions, and you improve the, uh, if you insulate their home better, if you provide them with uh, more efficient um, heating systems, then you can have pretty dramatic, in, uh, dr uh, dramatic impacts on the health outcomes of those people that are being targeted. So in New Zealand, they found that uh, they dramatically slashed um, the hospitalizations that they saw for asthma-related conditions, as well as the costs of, uh, of prescriptions for asthma-related drugs. So this, this slide here kind of shows you the sort of level of confidence we have in the data here. So energy efficiency measures, are, it's pretty clear that they can reduce the indoor exposure factors related to health. Uh, there is also some very strong evidence linking those indoor exposure factors to potential health improvements. Then there are some uh, less uh, less well understood impacts on the wider social fabric. So I've been told I need to stop. I did have a couple of other slides on um, optimizing energy delivery, which is just showing that there are all sorts of sort of secondary costs associated with energy supply that can be reduced as a result of energy efficiency on the capacity side, lines, transmission. We're gonna hear a minute, actually, in a minute from our next speaker about uh, industrial productivity just to say that you can probably, um, you, can, you can decrease the payback, uh, well, the literature shows you can decrease the payback by roughly 50% from a lot of energy efficiency investments if you take into account all of the other uh, cost reductions associated with energy efficiency investments around operation and maintenance particularly. I'm just gonna show you one more slide. <coughs> this, is a, this, is, this is Paris last year. You can see it's covered in smog, and I think actually this is going to be another driver going forward for energy efficiency investment to tackle local air pollution. So with that, I'm going to finish, and uh, thank you for your time.
master's degree in economics from the English School of Economics. He has been with the company in Ospido and uh, and, and, and many company. And he is now uh, the VP for business development at Ospido. And he has been in charge of a um, major interesting uh, pilot project on energy efficiency in the aluminium industry. Which is the highest selling car in the US. This has reduced 
the way for the car might to an antiquity below. North Europe is engaged globally in the entire aluminium value chain, from raw materials such as bauxite and alumina and electricity production to primary aluminium fabricated products and recycling. Recycling includes both the process scrap from the revolving and extrusion fabrication and from end of life products. So Hydro is also focusing on R&D and technology innovation throughout the value chain. Its strong focus on improvements in aluminium electrolysis technology, which we regard as the heart of an aluminium company. The aims to be climate neutral by 2020. This includes reducing direct and indirect emissions, improving the usage phase benefits, and increasing the share of recycled metal. Hydro has over decades systematically reduced the specific energy consumption of aluminium electrolysis and has made a step change improvement by the new HAL 4E technology that I will talk more about. The long term mission is to get down to more 10 kilowatt hours per kilo of aluminium. And for your background information, the theoretical energy usage for this process is about 6.7 kilowatt hours per kilo. And 100 years ago, the process used 10 times as much energy than as that, so the improvements of time have been considerable. Hydro has also put a lot of emphasis on reducing specific direct CO2 and other climate gas emissions from the electrolysis process, and has since 1990 reduced these by over 70% for the smelters in Norway. This graph shows the total emissions from the electrolyzing production, including the indirect farming from the power source. The power source is a key factor regarding total climate gas emissions from aluminium production, since indirect emissions from coal-based electricity is about nine times as high as the direct emissions from the electrolyzers. And this uh, then reflects black coal and not, uh, not brown coal. Since the uh, European emissions trading system directly affects the price of electricity both on the continent and in Scandinavia to the leakage of transmission capacity, it is critical for the industry in Europe that the present transition of the compensation system is prolonged also after 2020 to avoid carbon leakage. Norway, for instance, uses 100% renewables that produce aluminium, while in China more than 90% of the power is coal-based. Moving aluminium production from Norway to China will hence increase the CO2 emissions by a factor of 8. So moving into the <coughs> aluminium technology world, this shows an aluminium electrolysis. Cell. One cell of this, te uh, this uh, technology version produces about 1200 tons per year, and there is roughly 350 cells in a full scale pipeline. One cell is 4.5 times 16 meters, and the full pipeline is about 1200 meters long. Hero's new R4E technology has a 50% higher amperage and production per cell and 10% lower energy consumption than, than Hydro's existing technology. Hydro is also testing out an improved version called HAL 4 e Ultra that can reduce energy consumption by a further 4 to 7%.
really need to find the direct response. Uh, because as a trade-off, 